without any further ado, uh, Steve, uh, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate the kind, uh, kind introduction. And you know, tonight's topic is about the landmark study. I've given this webinar before, but I think we have to repeat this every now and then just so the new people coming on board can understand how unique the products we are that we have and the evidence that we have that nobody else has that our products work. Um, I sometimes call this a study that forever changed the way we think about supplementation. And you know, it's actually apropos because just this morning I got an email from the downline about some article that appeared on Google or Yahoo about how you know there were no studies that supported that vitamins actually improved your health, reduced the risk of heart attack. Um, it was just expensive urine, you know, the same sort of thing we hear over and over again. So I think it's particularly apropos that we talk about the landmark study today. So what is the landmark study? Simply put, it's the very first study of its kind. It really is truly unique. It was the very first study that was designed to evaluate the benefits and the risks of multiple supplement use over a long period of time. And let's talk about why that's important. Because we should look at the limitations of the scientific studies prior to the landmark study. And that's really almost all of the scientific studies that are out there. And you know as well as I do that there's a tremendous controversy. One day you'll get a study that says, well, vitamin E is going to do this. And the next day you'll see a study that says, no, it doesn't. Sometimes you'll see studies that seem to suggest there are benefits from taking supplements. Other times you'll see a benefit that studies will talk about the risks. So that's because all of these studies have some very significant limitations. And one of the most difficult, one of the most significant limitations is it's really difficult to ask the right questions. You know, one of the things, uh, sort of a story that I share with new students when they first start working in the lab, which kind of illustrates the way scientists work. It's the story about, and I may have related it on one of these calls before, but it's on the, it's the drunk on his hands and knees under the, under the lamppost, and the policeman comes up and he says, what are you looking for? And the drunk says, I'm looking for my house keys. So the policeman, being an obliging sort, gets down there and he looks around and he says, you know, I don't see your keys here anywhere. Are you sure you lost them here? To which the drunk replies, no, I lost them over there, but the light's better here. <laughs> and that really, you know, illustrates the way we work in science. We often can't ask the questions we'd really like to ask because, you know, the, the, we, we can't shine the light on it. We have to go to where there is, where we can illuminate the question, and that limits the questions that we can ask. So one of the questions that everybody would really like to know was if holistic approaches are beneficial. And yet, so almost all the studies out there have been done, and again, this is sort of considered to be the scientific method, the, sci the gold standard, you, if you will, of clinical studies, is you only change one variable at a time. That's one of the benchmarks, gold standards, as I said. So, you know, if you're looking at a holistic approach where you've got a number of different things, that kind of flies in the face of what we consider to be the gold standard of how we do experiments. And then, but for that very reason, our 21st century science is very ill-equipped to evaluate holistic approaches. So if we look at that, for example, so you can ask, why have so many studies not been able to show clear benefits of individual supplements? And we think about that, vitamins are not drugs. Uh, you know, you have a drug that's, tr that's created to, create, to treat a specific disease and usually it's affecting a specific enzyme that's related to that specific disease. Well, that's a very, you know, that's what we might think of as a magic bullet. Although we realize that drugs are, <coughs> are not magic bullets as much as we would like because they all have side effects. They affect other processes in the body besides the disease they're trying to treat. But even so, vitamins are never going to be magic bullets. Let's take, a, let's take colon cancer for an example. I heard a wonderful talk about 10, 10 or 15 years ago now. One of the world's experts in colon cancer was presenting his research at, a, at the um, American Association for Cancer Research meetings, which I attended on a yearly basis. And one of the things he said was, uh, you, know, um, you know, my studies show unequivocally 
that a that if you have a high fiber if you have a lifestyle that includes a high fiber diet a low fat diet one that provides adequate calcium and adequate B vitamins and the people who had adequate calcium and B vitamins were often supplementing and includes exercise and weight control that's going to dramatically reduce the risk of colon cancer but I can't show that any single one of them is effective by itself. Now you think about what should the take-home message be and you've seen some of these take-home messages. You've probably seen headlines that say, you know, there's really no evidence that a high fiber diet can reduce the risk of colon cancer. And you see other headlines that say, don't worry about the fat content of your diet. That can't really be proven to decrease the risk of cancer. Or don't worry about getting adequate calcium or adequate B vitamins. There really isn't any convincing evidence. So if you take those things apart and you know look at them one at a time, there's absolutely you know you can't prove that they they play a role that they actually are beneficial. But is that the take-home message we should be? Just ignore all of that stuff. Don't pay attention to any of it. When we know that a holistic approach, which includes all of those things, can give you a dramatic decrease in the risk of colon cancer. To me, that's what the take-home message should be. And that's why, you know, with all these studies where they're just looking at individual supplements and not looking at a holistic approach, there's, those are severe limitations. They're not really telling us what, what we'd like to be studying. So the question is, why doesn't somebody do a study to determine whether a holistic approach to supplementation is beneficial? Well, the answer is, somebody has. The landmark study was the very first study to look at the benefits of multiple supplement use. The very first one. Now the other thing is if you look, you know, we, you're looking at diseases here. And most scientific studies are very short term. You know, if you're, if you're doing an interventional trial where you're giving somebody maybe a vitamin versus a placebo or a drug versus a placebo, if you do a six month study that's a pretty long study. You're going to spend a lot of money doing that kind of study. Um, you know, if it goes on to a year or two years or three years, those are considered extremely long-term studies. So very few of those that are done, but diseases take 10 to 30 years to develop. So how do you actually look at whether you can impact the, the risk of disease? So for years, the question has been, why didn't somebody do a study to determine whether long-term use of supplements is beneficial. And again, the answer is, of course, somebody has. And the landmark study was the very first study to look at the benefits of long-term supplement use. This is supplement use of 20 years or more. And then there's a question, and you've seen those headlines. There's some, of these, some studies that seem to suggest that supplement use might even be dangerous. I've seen headlines recently talking about killer vitamins. Uh, so pe some people get scared. Well, again, those studies are generally done with individual high purity supplements and usually at fairly high doses. And when you do that, those supplements actually interfere with the absorption of other closely related nutrients that have health benefits of their own. So yes, if you do that kind of study, so <laughs> sometimes you can end up worse than if you, you know, hadn't intervened at all. So, yes, under the wrong conditions, supplement use might not be good. So the question has been for years, why doesn't somebody do a study to determine whether long-term multi-supplement use, not individual high-dose supplements, but a multi-supplement, a holistic approach, can that be harmful? And again, the answer is now that somebody has, because the landmark study was the very first study to address that question, that safety of long-term multiple supplement use. So that just gives you sort of a background about sort of the, the, what makes a landmark study so different from a lot of the other clinical studies. The ones that make the headlines in the newspapers or on Google or Yahoo or wherever people get their information nowadays. But let's talk about the landmark study itself. And first we need to talk about who ran the landmark study. Um, Dr. Gladys Block ran it at UC Berkeley. And, you know, that means a lot more to me than it does to you because I've been, been in the field of nutrition for over 40 years. I know that she is one of the most respected scientists in the field of nutrition. She's really one of the top scientists in what we call 
of nutritional assessment. So if you look at almost any study that's out there, if somebody's looking at, well, um, how many servings of dairy products are people consuming in the country today, or necessarily maybe soft drinks versus dairy product consumption, or how many servings of cheese, how many servings of pizza, all those sorts of things. Well, chances are they were filling out forms that she designed because she's the expert. She's the one that everybody uses their her forms when they want to do their studies. She has hundreds of publications. She's designed and validated these nutrition assessment forms that everybody else uses. So, like I say, she's, she's the best of the best. And she approached Shackley. It wasn't the other way around. She approached Shackley to do a study to design, to, you know, because this is something that she had wanted to, uh, wanted to look at for a long period of time. So she said she approached Shackley, and she, this was to be able to do this long-term holistic approach to supplementation to see whether it's safe and effective. She approached Shackley because of the reputation for integrity and the quality of their products, but also, of course, because Shackley had the perfect population group of long-term supplement users. Now, I want to emphasize that this was a completely independent study. Dr. Block designed the study. She designed the questionnaire. She analyzed the data. She interpreted the data and wrote the paper. It was published in the Nutrition Journal in 2007. But the really important thing to understand is if Dr. Block had analyzed the data and found that the use of the Shackley supplements had no effect or even worse, that they were detrimental, those are the conclusions that she would have published. Shackley didn't control those data. So that's why so few companies allow independent studies with their products. When you think about it, you've got to have a lot of confidence in your products before you're going to allow somebody to come in and do a study like that that might end up saying that your products did absolutely no good. So let's look a little bit at the study design because I think that's also very important. The Shackley group was a group that had been using the Shackley product, using multiple Shackley supplements for 20 years or more. And then what Dr. Block did is she compared them to, to a, a group that used just multivitamins alone and a group that used no supplements whatsoever. And these groups were matched. They were matched with respect to age, with gender, with race, with weight. Um, you know, the only major difference was the kinds of vitamins they were using, whether they were using the multiple Shackley supplements, any other company's multivitamin, or no supplements whatsoever. So let's look at the results of this. And this is where it really is astounding. Now, the first thing that, they, that they, she looked at was blood nutrient levels. This is just a, sort of a measure of bioavailability. And what she found is she looked at folic acid, vitamins A, C, E, alpha carotene, and beta carotene were the ones that she analyzed. Uh, what she found was the blood levels of all of those were greater than either the multivitamin group or the no supplement user group. So what this shows is that clearly the, the nutrients are being utilized. This is an independent verification that the nutrients in the Shackley supplements are bioavailable. And, you know, you, 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 uh, you probably guessed that. You've seen that in some of the articles that have been published and you've read it in, in the newspaper. The nutrients in many of the multivitamins don't appear to be as bioavailable as the nutrients in, Shackley's, uh, in the Shackley supplements. Next, she looked at biomarkers of disease risk. These are the, you know, the blood markers and things like that that indicate the risk of disease. So homocysteine. Homocysteine is an amino acid byproduct that is uh, thought to be associated with increased risk of heart disease, also thought to be increased, associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's. So you want that to be as low as possible. And that was lower in the Shackley group than either the multivitamin or the no supplement user group. CRP or C-reactive protein is a measure of inflammation. And you may have heard that inflammation is not a good thing. Uh, inflammation is associated with an increased risk of a lot of different diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, just to name a few. And so you want the C-reactive protein to be as low as possible. And once again, it was significantly lower in the Shackley group than either the multivitamin or no supplement user group. And then there are the triglycerides. 
Triglyceride is just a fancy scientific word for fat floating around in the bloodstream, which you might guess is not a good thing. And the triglycerides in the Shackley group were also lower than in the other two groups. And finally, if you look at the ratio of bad cholesterol to good cholesterol, obviously that's something you want to be as low as possible. And that was lower in the Shackley group. On the other hand, HDL, that's a good cholesterol, you want to be higher. And that was higher in the Shackley group than in either of the other two groups. Now here's the really interesting thing. The average age of these groups was 65. And there wasn't a single individual in the Shackley group that had elevated triglycerides or C-reactive protein. Not one. And, you know, when you look at groups of that size and that age, that's almost unheard of in the U.S. population. But it really gets remarkable when you start to look at disease incidence. So there was a two to three fold lower incidence of coronary heart disease, heart attacks, angina, congestive heart failure, stroke, and emphysema in the multi-supplement group. So somebody says, well, supplementation is just a waste of money. It's not going to reduce the risk of heart disease. Well, that may be true if you're just taking other companies' multivitamins, but it's not true if you're taking, you're using the, the holistic uh, supplementation, using multiple supplements from the Shackley group, which, by the way, those multi-supplements that the Shackley group were using have now all been incorporated in the vital engine. So that two to three-fold lowerings of coronary heart disease, heart attack, angina, congestive heart failure, stroke, and emphysema, people who are using the Shackley supplements for 20 years or more had remarkably better health. You know, this, and then the other thing is there was a fourfold lower incidence of diabetes in the Shackley group, and that difference was highly significant. Think about that for a minute. There was no difference in age, in gender, in ethnicity, or in weight. So it wasn't that this group was younger or skinnier than the other two groups. They'd just been using the Shackley supplements for 20 years or more, and they had fourfold lower incidence in diabetes. So this is really health outcomes. And this is something that's absolutely unique to this study. And it's absolutely unique in that no other company has this kind of evidence that their products will dramatically improve people's health. Then there's well-being. And you might say, well, that's kind of a wishy-washy thing. But again, Gladys Block is the expert in the field. And she's developed questionnaires that are really pretty darn good on allowing people to rate their, their, their well-being. And the Shackley group was two times more likely to rate their health as very good or excellent than the other two groups. You know, the Shackley group just felt better. Finally, medication use. This is kind of interesting because, um, you know, again, the average age of these groups was around 65. And if you just look at what the U.S. Pharmacopeia says, um, the... Uh, for Americans in the age range of 60 to 65, the average medication use is 6 to 10 medications. For uh, Americans that are over age 65, the average medication use is 10 to 15. And if you look at that Shackley group, the medication use was 0 0.6. Um, you know, that's remarkable. When you think about uh, all the side effects of medications and then people ending up taking medications to treat the side effects of the other medications they're taking, you know, that's just, that's a huge health benefit there alone. But you know, what you know is that because you, you, again, you've seen these articles out there about, you know, supplements might be dangerous. So one of the things that you wanted to look at uh, Dr. Block wanted to look at was what were the risks of long-term supplementation. So she looked at the markers of three nutrients that were known to be able to accumulate at toxic levels. So these are the ones you would be most worried about if you were thinking that, well, this multiple supplement use, yeah, they're taking lots of stuff, but they're probably accumulating toxic levels of certain nutrients. These are the ones you'd be most likely to be accumulating toxic levels of if you were overdosing. So she looked at ferritin, which is a marker of too much iron, retinol, which is a marker of the vitamin A levels, and 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is a marker of vitamin D levels. None of those were present at toxic levels in anyone 
in the Shackley group. So the, you know, that's just because you know Shackley designs their supplements with safety in mind. They, they keep in mind that even though they may say take one pill, some people may take two or three or four or five, and so they design them with a margin of safety in mind. So what does a landmark study really mean for you and for me? Well, as Dr. Gladys Block said, and scientists are fairly, <coughs> we're a fairly restrained bunch, so we, we tend to be cautious in how we interpret studies, but she said the study results were very impressive and support the potential benefits of long-term use of dietary supplements. Now you might ask, does this apply to supplements made by other companies? And it's kind of interesting. There are other supplement companies out there that are saying they have proof that you're going to be healthier if you use their supplements. And if you actually look at the study they quote, it's this study. It's not a study that's been done with their supplements. It's our study. It was done with the Shackley supplements. And when you think about the fact that most companies don't use the same level of quality assurance in the manufacture of their products that Shackley does. And very few companies run clinical tests on their products before they manufacture them to make sure that those nutrients are actually delivered into the bloodstream. The results of the landmark study may not apply to supplements made by other companies. We just don't know until they do their own study, if they have the courage to do that, um, they can't really say that their, their products are going to give comparable results. So if we just were to wrap it all up and I can give you a summary, the landmark study was the very first study to look at the safety and efficacy of long-term supplementation. Nobody else has done a study like this before. The Shackley supplement users had better levels of blood nutrients, which is evidence that these products deliver the nutrients into your bloodstream. The Shackley supplement users had healthier levels of biomarkers of disease risk, things like C-reactive protein, cholesterol, uh, HDL, all of those things that, in, that indicate increase or decrease risk of disease, which basically says that using Shackley products over a period of time lowers the risk of disease. But the most important thing, and the thing that really sets us apart from any other study, and sets the proof behind the Shackley products apart from the proof that any other company has is this study shows that using Shackley products actually improves your health. The Shackley supplement users had lower incidence of major diseases. And, you know, the Shackley supplement users rated their health as better, so they just plain felt better. And there was no detectable risk associated with long-term Shackley supplement use. So the products are safe. So if you're looking for a longer, healthier life, or you're looking for more energy and vitality, Shackley has the proof that their products can deliver what you're looking for. Thank you for joining me. Very good. Steve, let me say something here. Right, can you hear me? You yes, I can. I think I've heard you go through the landmark study a couple times, maybe two or three times. Um, but just your emphasis tonight was see, much different. Uh, I hadn't heard all those things about Dr. Block. And uh, uh, maybe if I missed it last time, I missed it. But uh, this was so much more clear, the clarity for me, uh, for some reason. Uh, that, that was just terrific. Um, I really appreciate that. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, that, uh, anyone, anyone have any questions or comments that you'd like to uh, ask Dr. Cheney? If you do, just kind of in the uh, place where it says questions. <laughs> kind of simple, right? And then I'll read them and uh, we'll go. 